I don't know what happened, but the character suddenly felt very real. <laughs> I look unhinged. <laughs> and things are a little bit... Oh my god, ah! That's painful. Selena is playing with a demon's corpse for like fun, to like tease Rowan. She like grabbed its fingers and was like, boring. I don't know, Kale is so boring. He's so flat. Ugh. I'm stressed out. It's not real, it's not real, it's not real. Lorcan is seven feet tall. What happened to him? Why is Rowan only six four? Seven feet, why? Ew, she's kissing Kale. That's, that's icky. Don't do it, don't read it. Hey everyone, it's Nicole. Welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, don't forget to subscribe. I like to post about books and music, mostly Taylor Swift. Today is going to be the start of another reading vlog. I'm going to be marathoning slash binging the entire Throne of Glass series. Marathoning slash binging. <laughs> Little did I know, I would be starting this series in early June and not finishing until late August. I have a really good sizable TBR stack, but then I placed some holds because everyone's been talking about Akatar lately on like all of my social medias. And I originally was going to read that. Then I found out it's not even a finished series or maybe it is, I'm kind of confused on that. It doesn't seem finished, but Throne of Glass for sure is a finished series. This is going to be a spoiler free reading vlog so you can see if this series is worth the hype, but I will have a spoiler section at the end for anybody who wants to discuss. I actually don't believe I've ever really read a high fantasy type series. I've done my research on the reading order and I think I'm going to start with the novellas because it gives a lot more backstory to the world that we are in. All I know is that this series is about a female assassin. There's a few different kinds of romances going on. I don't believe it's too spicy. I feel like Akatar is pretty spicy but yeah I will be reading the novella prequel first. Novellas. There's five novellas but I was able to find a book with just all of them in one. I'm going to be reading the penultimate and the one before that. I think it's like Tower of Dawn and Queen of Shadows, I believe. I'm going to be reading those in tandem with each other because I guess they take place during the same time. It's not like a chronological thing. And I found a reading order online of what chapters you're supposed to read of each one before you like switch to the next one and just kind of complete them at the same time. So I'm very excited to be doing that because I've never done that with a book before. Books, I guess. So that section is probably going to be happening concurrently in the timestamps down below. I think that's about all. I'm gonna be going into this kind of blind as I said. It's a female assassin and that's all I know. Hopefully we'll be getting some more explanation and a backstory with this novella prequel collection. I really 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 hope this is as good as everyone says it is because I just finished reading It by Stephen King this morning and um I could not take it seriously. I like a lot of Stephen King's works but it was really rough. It was really rough. <laughs> it was like on crack. It's more of like a comedy than a horror. I I swear to God. I feel like 80% of books that are over 600 pages probably shouldn't be over 600 pages. It is Friday night and it's kind of late and I have to be up kind of early tomorrow so I think I'm just going to read the first prequel in this book. It's just until page 77 so that shouldn't take long. Kind of a busy weekend to start us off so hopefully I'll be able to kind of kick off at least one prequel a day until actual weekdays are occurring and then maybe I'll be able to hit them a lot faster. Time to start. <laughs> Perhaps if you hadn't been reading all night, you wouldn't be so exhausted. Guilty. so good.
Okay, so it wasn't anything like absolutely stunning. I mean, it's a little freaking 70 page novella prequel, but oh my God, we have a little setup for a little enemies to lovers. I'm already into it. There's lots of pirates. There's mentions of Faye, but I don't think any appeared in this first prequel. The vibes are good. The main character, Selena, I think her name is. Sorry, I have to let my cat in. <laughs> Come on. You want to be in the video? So we've got our main character, Selena, who's like one of the best assassins there is. She's literally only 16, by the way. And she has a friend who's also an apprentice of the same person she is. Princess, I'm talking. If you want me to hold you, I can hold you. That's what's going to shut you up but like you have to stay in my arms then. So Sam and Selena are both being trained by this same like mentor who's teaching them, princess please, how to be like the best assassins that there are. And Selena is supposedly like the best one. She's being trained to like take over for their mentor. I forgot his name, it starts with an A. It's a fantasy series, so I don't know how to pronounce like shit. I kept looking back to the map in the beginning because they were naming like these different areas on the map. I'm glad that we're having these like five prequel novellas because I want to familiarize myself with the locations and each one I think is probably only going to focus on like a small area at a time. So this one had Sam and Selena's mentor sending them to go do this like business deal with this pirate. His name is Rolf. Selena is just like sassy about everything and she's a fiery character. Some of the things in the beginning I was like okay this is a little bit cringy. She's like always angry all the time but I don't know you're 16 what can you do? And then Sam is 17 and so he sends these two teenagers to go do business for him with this pirate. And Selena is like not too pleased with the circumstances surrounding this deal and she like is trying to persuade Sam to see from her point of view and they like create this whole plan. I don't want to spoil anything. At the end things were happening. There was a lot of it got very fast paced like about halfway through to the end and I was really liking it. But then they kind of like cover up what they've done in this way that I feel like I feel like they're not going to get away with it completely. Like it seems like they did but I just feel like their mentor is going to be asking questions because it just seems way too like neatly wrapped up in a bow. It was good though. That was a really good start to this series I'm excited because the Sam Selena enemies to lovers thing I'm feeling it I'm really feeling it at first I was like this is a little cringy but halfway through and then on till the end I was like yes absolutely this is what I'm after it was probably three out of five stars I know that doesn't seem so high compared to like how much I'm raving about this I'm raving about the world building and like the potential that this has as a series like now I'm very excited to really get into the meat and potatoes but as a novella itself like it's fine it's just a 70 page quick thing nothing crazy out of the ordinary or unique it was just a really good setup with some characters that I'm definitely going to be enjoying. Okay, today is the next day. Sorry, I look kind of wrecked. I'm missing a chunk of my eyeshadow. I don't know how I just lost a clean chunk of it. I went and saw The Little Mermaid today live action. If you can't tell, that's what I'm dressed for. I put on like every piece of sea merch that I could find. I love this. This is honestly, I need to wear this more. Um, and I did my makeup inspired by her tail and like clam bra. This is obviously the clam bra and then this is like the tail. But in the live action, her tail's like a purple blue and not like a greenish blue. It's not my best work, but I was in a rush and it's been on me for a while and now I'm getting greasy and oxidized. So we're just gonna turn that off. That's I have my mermaid ring on, which I love. I have this ocean wave. Hi princess, and then the sea turtle. I'm very on theme. Today I'm going to be starting the second novella, The Assassin and the Healer. Princess, please let me talk. Speaking of pets, Max, Eric's dog in the film, the live action one, is so cute. I'm obsessed. He's like a perfect real life version of the dog in the original 1989 movie. But yeah, it was an absolutely amazing live action film. I think it's probably my favorite live action Disney movie that I've seen so far. I haven't seen Mulan and Aladdin. I saw Cinderella and Beauty and the Beast and Jungle Book, I believe. The Lion King didn't look good at all, so I didn't see it. So I'm gonna like take a shower and then I'm gonna start this one and I'm very excited because this stop zipping for five seconds because the first novella was very promising also I need to show you what you're balancing on right now how many times do I have to tell you I'm filming <laughs> 
today was everything to me okay i'm out of the shower also can we just talk about how many times she mentions the stench of unwashed bodies it's high fantasy so i don't know exactly what time period this is it's giving very like 1700s i think but yeah that sucks that really sucks i feel bad for her i'm now just going to speed through the second novella sitting here because i just took two benadryl and the clock is ticking <laughs> bodies again what is this like the fifth time we're on page 89 <laughs> okay so it seems she did get caught or like suffering consequences for what unfolded in the first novella where i was like i don't think she's gonna get away with this she didn't <laughs> not completely anyways and that's like the entire premise of this one okay thank god so they're like following in consecutive order and it's not jumping characters it's the same selena and it is focusing on a different part of the map so i get to kind of like explore each one in each novella i'm assuming <laughs> I took two Benadryl. Can you let me finish? It's getting a little fruity. Does it smell fruity in here to you? calls other women females. That's a red flag. Okay, I finished. It's probably another three star as well. This one was a little more like women supporting women. There wasn't like a romance really going on. Unless you count the slight bit of fruitiness that I saw in this one. It was like that trope of like healing someone's wounds. Um, basically, Selena meets this healer and it's a little fruity. But also she talks about Sam and how they're like friends now, which is the person who was really giving enemies to lovers in the first novella. I really like that it's in chronological order. She is now sleeping on a ship heading towards some kind of barren desert waste land where she has to go train with some other assassin as her punishment for doing what she did in the first novella with Sam and how I thought she was gonna get caught and she did. This is now her punishment. She has to go to like this deserted place and do some remote training there. It was fine. The females thing was a little cringy. I'm so tired of reading the phrase unwashed bodies. I'm still very excited for the main series because I feel like those are just going to be better. I'm trying to breeze through one of these novellas real quick before I have to start working this morning. The fact that her mentor Arabin, I think it's pronounced, literally beat her for what she did two novellas ago is just insane. Like in the first novella, she was talking about him almost kind of like a father figure. Like the vibe was very like, oh, he taught me everything I know, like very respectful of him. And now obviously it's like an abusive thing. And I, what? This is dark. I have an update. Okay, so I finished the third novella off camera. I don't want to have just a ton of clips of me reading. This was the longest one yet. And I think the best one. I still would rate it three out of five just because I'm someone who sticks to the unfortunately only five choice rating of like Goodreads because I use Goodreads. If Goodreads had half stars, I would probably give this one a 3.5. It's not like amazing just because I think it is a novella and this is a story that's just gonna shine through more in the main series. We're understanding more about this world. I'm understanding Selena a little bit more. She meets this girl named Ansel and this is like Selena's first female friend that she ever really has. Not counting the girl, oh what was her name? I already forgot. In the previous novella who was a healer, but that was a little fruity. I noticed Selena and Ansel, it's very much like a female friendship going on. Is the healer and the assassin, is she actually trying to make this fruity or am I just jumping to conclusions? I'm not even gay. I just like find romance in like the smallest interactions. It seemed more like in this one they were trying to set up this love story, not love story, but like an attraction between Selena and 
the son of the assassin trainer in the desert, the mute master basically. His son is kind of attracted to Selena. She kind of like shares in that attraction with him, but she's thinking of Sam back home, the enemies to lovers guy from the first novella. But basically her little relationship she has with Ansel friendship is a little complicated in this book, but there are some amazing quotes that come out of this longer novella just pertaining to female friendship. And you know, we discover a little bit more about this world, how it's very much like a patriarchal society, just like our own. And I always thought high fantasy classified as something that was like very intimidating and complex to get into, but there are just so many parallels to our world that I don't feel that overwhelmed. Also, I think having a set of novellas to really immerse you into the world before you get into like the full main series is also very helpful. I'm understanding things more. I just want to get into the full series so badly. I have this much left, two novellas, but the writing style was just really shining. I think this being the longest one is why it's one of the best novellas because the plot lines just have more time to develop the writing style is just more interesting. She has more to say. Characterization is like happening in this longer novella. I think it was over a hundred pages. I wrote down some thoughts. Yeah, I think female friendships going forward in this series will be very interesting. This one had a bit of a twist, but I do like where it was going originally. The twist was like interesting. It was just, you know, the setup was very one thing and then we got something completely different towards the end. She had enough pages in this novella to really get the ball rolling, I guess. I think that's about it, honestly. I'm going to try to like quickly speed through the last two novellas tonight, but I'm not completely sure if I'm gonna have time. We're gonna give it a solid attempt. I just wanna start the first book in the series tomorrow so bad. I guess those more tricky political backgrounds and histories probably is more like adult adult fantasy than young adult fantasy. We'll see where I go from here. This is like the first real actual fantasy I'm reading other than like the Twilight series, Warrior Cats, The Nine Lives of Chloe King, Oh Daughters of the Moon, The Need series, which was fucking terrible. Oh, and Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, which just kind of historical fantasy. I guess I've actually read a lot of it, but I don't think I've ever read high fantasy and I didn't even really know what that was. So we're just dipping our toes into new things here. Actually, wait, I think I have. Is the Book of Ivy high fantasy? I can't even find it. I don't even know where I put it. I'm getting too many books. But yeah, I thought it wasn't just not taking place in our world, but something that was just nearly impossible to grasp. It was so different. And that's not seeming like the case. So you know what? I might really get into this shit after reading Throne of Glass. Just like really get into fantasy. Okay, I'll update you tomorrow. I'm on the Assassin in the Underworld and I just have to pop in to say there is like a crazy example of an abusive situation going on with Eric who is like her father figure who trained her to become an assassin and he like sent her to go train in the desert as punishment but before he did that he like beat the shit out of her for doing something he didn't want her to do like ruining something for him basically she comes back from this training and he's apologizing to her and she's like stunned because she was gonna like move out and tell him it's completely over she's leaving him not like in a romantic way but he's like a father figure he trained her from when she was small like she's done relying on him and he like grovels like at her feet he gets down on like his knees and he is like apologizing He's like love bombing her. It's such like textbook, like abusive behavior. And like Selena, like the gears are turning in her head and she's like being convinced by him and thinking about how like, well, I don't really have anyone other than him. And like jumping to these conclusions when she doesn't even know what her future could look like without him. He's giving her gifts, love bombing. You should never give gifts when you apologize to someone. Like then they're going to associate that thing with what you did to them. But he just like is relentless, keeps giving her these gifts. Oh my God, Selena. Do they not have like psychology textbooks or like classes you can take in this? fantasy world i'm like so frustrated with her because otherwise she's such a strong like fiery character and she's like putting up with this but she's like 17 so it's like yeah you're easily manipulated even if you have a strong personality a freaking grown 40 year old man can easily take advantage of you like that it's not gonna change i think he's gonna beat her again i'm calling it now also when she came back from the desert he said i'm sorry like three separate times as she was like very hesitant to forgive him and it reminds me so much of the scene from taylor swift's all too well short film where dylan o'brien's character is like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like, don't give me that look, it's fucked up. He's not, he doesn't even really realize what he's done wrong. He's just saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like, it's some kind of like coin you can put into someone until they like forgive you or something. It's frustrating. She probably was not like traditionally educated in school. It was like this assassin school she was going through. But it's realistic at the same time though, because this is how it would happen if a 40 year old man was like manipulating a 17 year old girl like this. I think it's really well written. It is chapter two. He's already given her two presents to try to get 
her forgiveness in this way instead of trying to ask for forgiveness by changing his behavior. And it literally says none of these presents came close to earning any sort of forgiveness, but she couldn't contain her squeal when she opened the box and like what she finds in it. And it's like so exciting. It's like this slow wearing down of your psyche until maybe you even forget why you were so mad in the first place because they've like conditioned you into like getting this high that's associated with them because of all these gifts. It's so simple, but it's so accurate. So I finished the assassin in the underworld and I definitely should have vlogged me reading it because holy shit, the pacing, everything about that one was just, oh my God. The enemies to lovers was lovering. I was right about Arabin, by the way, the whole love bombing gift giving thing. It's definitely not a sign of someone who is willing to make actual changes to their behavior. Selena kind of made like a, a stupid mistake in this one, especially in regards to like how he was like love bombing her and all of that stuff. And there's something that happens related to that. She's like easily manip manipulable, manipulated. There we go. She's easily manipulated because of this. Like she starts, you know, her resolve starts to get worn down with all of these apologies and gifts that Arabin gives her. And she ends up being kind of taken advantage of in a way. And it's really frustrating because you can kind of see her thought process being unsure as her resolve is wearing down so it definitely feels like something that could have been avoided if she would have just trusted her gut and her intuition but she's 17 what can you do i think it was pretty realistic for a character of that age to behave in such a way there's another betrayal in this one similarly to the last one we read i'm sure there's going to be lots of themes of that happening in the main series i just have this feeling it's going to be like heart-wrenching betrayals happening but oh my god the scenes i don't feel like this is a spoiler because it's like i told you it felt like enemies to lovers and sometimes people feel like that trope and stating that a book has that trope is like a spoiler but it's like something like this sets it up from the beginning like oh these two characters have this dynamic but like maybe they feel something deeper for each other sam and selena selena her partner sam who's a year older than her selena is 17 in this novel he's 18 and things are happening selena gets herself into some trouble and what do you know sam is there the pacing of it is what's so just delectable because literally like two chapters later after this very intense scene and Selena's in trouble and oh my god is Sam gonna help her is he gonna be successful we see some things happening in the way of romance and the way it's written is just so delightful like their dialogue between each other the way it's set up the tension the angst it's just and it's on a very small scale because it is a novella and it just again makes me so excited to read the full series it's very pining dramatic this has been the best one so far I'd definitely give it a four stars out of five I'm really Really afraid there's gonna be some five star books in this series. I'm afraid I'm gonna be feeling a lot of emotions while reading this series. But yeah, this one just had great character development, really great plot lines. Like after these last four novellas, we've seen them kind of being built up. All of these five novellas together is like the length of a standard novel. We're not really doing what I thought we were doing, where we would like visit a different area of the map each time. You know, Selena goes on this like crazy journey. She lives here and then she kind of goes down here and then she's over here for a little bit and then she goes back to where she lives in Adderley and nothing's really happening over on this side which is fine I mean I think I'm familiar enough with what's going on and with the geography of the place it's a smallish country anyways so I feel not overwhelmed I feel like I have a really firm grasp on what's going on I'm so excited to see where it goes from here and now I'm going to be reading the very very last novella The Assassin and the Empire and I am going to be recording clips of me reading it because if this last one that I read was any indication I might be feeling things for this last one. So I'm very excited to get into that. Time to get all nice and cozy under my blankets with my snoozing cat. <laughs>
kidding me? I feel like I'm gonna throw up. was not supposed to happen. There's been a death. <laughs> there were so many things this character needed to tell this dead character. <laughs> Man, it was just getting started. <sighs> the thing about the soap. <laughs> if you know, you know. <laughs> Oh my god, I feel like I'm gonna throw up. I blame Arabin. Honestly, it wasn't really his fault. Like, he kept wanting more and more money. I just feel for this character who was left behind. That's awful. I wasn't expecting to feel this deeply, but like the characters were so developed at this point. I feel like this isn't gonna be the last time that I cry. So when I made my Taylor Swift Joel when Why It's Okay To Be Upset About Their Breakup video, and I was like comparing it to fiction, like when a couple breaks up in a book and you're like sad. I mean, like I never cried over Joe and Taylor. I was just like, oh, this is so sad. And I really like felt deeply. I was getting comments on that video, probably from like locals who don't know anything about what's going on but like so many people were like you shouldn't cry over fiction period like it's fake <laughs> like this is definitely not the channel for you then it's not real it's not real it's not real <sighs> hmm man <sighs> that hurt it okay continue <sighs> it's like the little things that she writes about <laughs> Okay, now something else seems to be being revealed. This is too much for me. smashed all my fucking hopes and dreams. How do I even rate that? At first, when the sad stuff started happening, I was like, you know, I'm a sucker for a book that can make me cry. Is this gonna be a five star? But honestly, I don't think the plot and everything was as interesting as the one that was before this. It was just really emotional and <sighs> there were some really good moments of writing style and grief. <laughs> the soap. Man, the soap! Like, I didn't know I'd be crying over soap. It wasn't supposed to happen like this. Oh my god. I feel so bad for this character who does not have this person anymore. But at the same time, did this character really deserve that person? Because they even expressed regrets about how they behaved. And now it's too late, so like you don't know what you have until it's gone. <laughs> oh fuck. I don't know how I'm supposed to just go from here into like the main series. I also don't feel like I should be this sad. Like, was it even that good? Like the first three novellas were very consistent. Three stars, I was like, oh, this is fun, this, this is fine. And then the last two, I don't know what happened, but the characters suddenly felt very real. <laughs> I look unhinged. <laughs> That's probably all I'm gonna do for tonight. I might read like the first couple chapters of the first Throne of Glass, I'll update tomorrow. God, I feel fucking nauseous. Don't do it. Don't read it. 
I mean, when you really, sorry, I just needed to come back in here for a second because I am emotional. Like when you think about like the very nature of this profession, Selena is literally an assassin. I assume she's going to meet some other assassins. Like you cannot get too invested or too attached to a character because they're a fucking assassin. It's just the nature of it. Like, oh my God. And she, there were desires to find like an honest profession, but it ended up not happening. I fucking blame Arabin, honestly, the mentor guy who's like shit and was a love bomb. I think everything kind of just comes back to him. This is her villain origin story. Okay, that's all. Okay, it is the next day. I'm feeling rough. You girls got a stomach bug. I have not been able to do much reading. I've just been trying to find things I can eat that aren't like irritating. Lots of rice. I had some applesauce and toast. Nothing spicy, which like torments me because I I could just like drink Cholula. No salty shit, like crazy salty shit like pickles, which again, I will literally drink pickle juice if you let me. I am now at the 50 page mark in the first Throne of Glass book and I don't have many thoughts. I'm still just so fucked up from what happened in the prequel novellas. The only thing I have to say is it's kind of giving Hunger Games. There's like this thing being set up where she's like pretty much in like a labor work camp and you know, due to the events of the very end of the last prequel novella, and obviously if you're starting from just this book you don't know her past everything that has happened so you start off the book she's just in this forced labor work camp from doing something then she's kind of taken out of it by the son of the king of adderland i think it is and she's essentially supposed to win some kind of competition to find the greatest assassin in all of the land and then she could become the king's champion and be released from prison so she's given this incentive to like compete for him it is very much giving like tribute of the hungry games but obviously this is fantasy and not dystopia but it's also kind of dystopia because we have this like monarchy and we learned more about selena's past and how she's from this one area that got like completely decimated by the monarchy all of the fae disappeared all of the witches there's like no magic in that land but but there were kind of a few little cute hints at how maybe she might like restore that because they were talking about the fae and she fell asleep in a tent she woke up and there were like tiny little footprints to her bed and somebody had left these flowers at the foot of her bed she knew it was some kind of like infant or a child who had done this obviously some kind of fae or something we haven't been introduced to any of those characters yet but yeah it's kind of slow it's kind of like slow paced this is a 400 page book i'm now an eighth of the way through and not much is happening so hopefully the ending will be a little more action-packed but yeah Katniss Everdeen Selena Sardothian getting similar vibes at least just from the main novel not including the prequel novellas that I already read okay it's like my third day on throne of glass I got really busy so I haven't made much progress I'm literally on page 135 Selena's not how she was in the prequel novellas completely like there's this guard who's pretty much watching after her and his name's Cole I think C-H-A-O-L I'm not sure how to pronounce it and he has to tell her like you need to take a bath like you need to wash yourself which is so crazy because the selena from the novellas was so high maintenance and loved to take a good long bath or multiple she was super girly and like i related to that i love to take a good long hot bath sometimes many i love a good soak but it just doesn't seem completely authentic to her character from the novellas which is interesting i guess like prison changed her also there seems to be a little something going on between selena and the actual prince at first i thought they were going to be pushing her in the direction of the guard cole but now it seems like maybe it's going to be the prince his name's dorian she also found another female friend this princess who's visiting from um, I don't know how to pronounce it again. The Kingdom of Yulwi. Supposedly she's helping some rebels who are against the imperial ambitions of the Kingdom of Adderland that's trying to like take over every country. So she's got like kind of a female friend. She speaks that princess's language as well and nobody else in the kingdom really does. It's a lot of just fantasy hunger games still. Very slow, not much to say. Supposedly she wrote these first couple books when she was like 15 and a lot of people find the writing of the first couple books kind of juvenile. I don't actually. What I find it is slow. It doesn't feel like that bad. I like the writing style, but it's just like, God, nothing is happening. Maybe that's what's juvenile about it. There's not like a super distinct plot line. They're all just training for these games. Some of the assassins have been killed. Um, someone murdered this one cannibal who literally eats people's eyes. They found him dead. And then another one tried to escape, so one of the guards like shot an arrow through his throat. There's no like tea. There's no like drama. I probably need to get like another hundred pages in before I'm able to give another like substantial update. Also, you need to read the prequel novellas first because there are 
spoilers in this first book. I guess the prequel novellas were super formed in her mind before she started writing the series because the characters from the prequel are like coming back into this one and like there's definitely spoilers for what happened to them in the prequel and if you don't want to be spoiled read the prequel novellas first. Yeah, that's about all. I'm gonna keep reading and hoping it, like the ball gets rolling. I have a few quick thoughts from reading before my work meeting. So it seems we've got a little bit of a love triangle going on between Cole, the guard guy, Dorian the prince, and Selena, but it's like kind of unclear if Cole actually likes her. But anyway, Cole and Dorian are kind of like fighting over Selena. She's a little bit attracted to Dorian. I don't think there's much going on about if there's anything actually happening between Cole and Selena or if Cole actually finds Selena attractive and vice versa. But yeah, it's love triangly. They're both like coming to her room in the middle of the night and like trying to interact with her. Also, all of these competitors, so many of them keep winding up dead in the castle and no one knows who's doing it. It's definitely not Selena. Elena, but it's kind of horrifying and someone's like eating them. It's like brutal and that's giving very much Chamber of Secrets So we have these like competitions every few days. Selena is still in the running There's this guy named Kane who seems to be the opponent She'll probably wind up with at the very end and she needs to like win so that she doesn't get sent back to Endovia the prison in the like salt mine mountains But yeah Chamber of Secrets these people keep turning up dead. No one knows why and also there is a literal chamber Selena finds this chamber in her bedroom like behind this tapestry, it's like a door. She goes down there and finds like this, I almost said esophagus. It's not an esophagus, it's a sarcophagus. Yes, and there's like dead kings and queens like Dorian's ancestors basically. And one of them, like this, the first queen of Adderlin, I guess, comes down from the spirit world to talk to her and is basically like, you need to win this competition. She gives her this amulet and it's supposed to protect her from whatever the hell is eating people in this castle. It's finally picking up a little bit. And yeah, we've got some like ghosty paranormal activity now, but that queen did specify she is not a ghost. She's some kind of, I don't know, she's supposed to just be helpful for Selena, give her advice. And she ends up going back down to that sarcophagus, not a soft and trying to figure out what exactly happened or if she was dreaming and the queen is nowhere to be found. It's just like her body there. It's nuts. Who's eating people? I'm finally a little bit interested now, actually. Literally, we are 200 pages in to the 400 page book and it's finally getting a little bit interesting. A little bit interesting. Still has nothing on the prequel novellas though. If I look rough, it's because it's been a busy week. I should not have started a reading vlog this week, but I finished Throne of Glass, the very first novel, and I have some thoughts. I don't know why my cat is obsessed with just like squinting into the field of view. Okay, she's leaving. I just didn't give a fuck about Cole or Dorian in the same way that I gave a fuck about Sam. Like, it's not just that I am more interested in enemies to lovers and that dynamic, more so than a love triangle. Like a love triangle can be cool and good. Like I ate Twilight up when I was nine years old. That was like the first YA I ever read. What is going on with my hair? Give me a good love triangle. But this one just wasn't good. It took forever and there was no chemistry. I was literally giggling at some parts when Sam was in the picture in the prequel. I just didn't care about Kohler Dorian. No chemistry, didn't understand the romance with either of those men and Selena. It just didn't make any sense. They were we're both like such privileged little boys and with Sam it was more interesting because like he's an assassin as well as Selena so they have something in common they grew up together and they like fought a lot but ultimately it like turned into something more it was just a lot more interesting and angsty I do think the Sam enemies to lovers thing could have been angstier I definitely could have enjoyed them spending a little bit more time as enemies but I understand it was a prequel thing she didn't really have a lot of time as far as like pages goes it was really good for what it was I think I love the Nehemia friendship with Selena I hope that that continues for a very long time, especially after seeing Selena get betrayed by her, I believe, only other female friend she's had in the prequel. Yeah, the very first Throne of Class book was very much Chamber of Secrets meets The Hunger Games, except slow as all hell. And it didn't even feel like there was a lot of world building or like characterization going on. I felt that a lot more in the prequel. The plot was bad, the characterization was bad. The Selena and Nehemia female friendship relationship going on was really good and I think that was pretty developed. But the two guys, it didn't make any sense to me. However, I still really like the setting. I love the world that the story is set in and I think the writing style is pretty good. I think we just need more time. I've heard there's one more slow book that is Crown of Midnight. My library gave me an upside down copy. This is 
whatever. I've heard this one's pretty slow and then it finally starts picking up at the third book. So I'm excited to hopefully get through this as fast as I can while being super busy. I really miss the good romance of the prequel, the shit that just had me giggling. It was pretty astounding to me that so many contestants in this competition were turning up dead, very a la Chamber of Secrets style. And I still just didn't care. Like I remember in Harry Potter, I was like, oh my God, these poor students. But we didn't learn much about the contestants. They were all very interchangeable, not really developed. You know, most of the time we spent in this book was just with Selena in her chambers and these two random men, Cole and Dorian, would come and visit her and somehow they still had no substance. <laughs> not terrible. I definitely enjoyed the writing style, as I said. This author is definitely good. I just didn't like the slow pacing of this one. I'm probably gonna start the second one tomorrow. I feel like this video is gonna be me just looking rougher and rougher as it goes on because I get busier and busier. We had a crazy storm last night that like knocked down one of our trees. A bunch of people lost power. We didn't, luckily. But I am just past the halfway point of Crown of Midnight. It's still really slow. I was getting so pissed at Kale. His name is Kale, by the way, not Cole. I've been saying it wrong. And Dorian, like I'm just not interested in them. Those two men as love interests are like human cardboard. Like there's just no intrigue, no chemistry. I'm bored. I think Selena rushed into some things, if you know what I mean, because of like what happened with Sam and like her choosing to wait and everything and what resulted from that. And then like nearly immediately some crazy shit went down. And right as I was starting to think, you know, I would 100% much prefer Nehemia to be the love interest than Dorian or Kale. Kale, I can't get over that. Some other things happened. I haven't yet gotten emotional. Like what happened in the prequel novellas hit me so much harder than anything that's happened in Throne of Glass or Crown of Midnight thus far. I just wanted Selena to get with Nehemia. It made so much more sense to me. There was such a strong relationship there as friends, but they would have been such a power couple. I don't want to spoil anything. I don't think I need to do a dedicated spoiler section for me kind of vaguely talking about what goes on because I don't have a whole lot to say. It's just right when you think something feels like good and like something romantic that Selena could pursue as what happened in the prequel, circumstances change and it ends up being not really possible. And I'm just salty about that. I'm so sick of Kale and Dorian. I like Selena as a character. Some people think she's kind of arrogant. I like how girly she is, honestly. I relate to that. I like how she's super girly, but also this badass. I think women can be two things at the same time. I think her character is very interesting. She's 18. Also, I feel like people are just like a little bit arrogant when they're 18. It makes sense for her age. I want some more interesting characters or for Kale and Dorian to have like actual character progression, some development going on because they just bore me. The plot is pretty interesting. There's like these riddles and there's kind of like this stirring rebel group happening who wants to overthrow the King of Otterlin, who's the guy who essentially employs Selena to kill a bunch of people because she won that King's Champion thing at the end of Throne of Glass and to get her freedom back and not be sent back to Endovir. She has to like work for him for four years, I think it is. And then she wants to just leave and not be an assassin anymore because it's a horrible way to live. Four years? But I mean, that's better than a lifetime in Endovir. Yeah, so she's like doing this double agent type thing, but she's scared and like there was this fight her and Nehemia were having where Nehemia wanted to free her people and she thought Selena was kind of on her side but then she was calling Selena a coward for being afraid to take more action because she doesn't want the king to come after her loved ones if she like disobeys him while she's kind of employed by him as his assassin. There's a lot of politics going on. It's so patriarchal. You're really seeing that come through in this second book and yeah hopefully I finish this one soon because I'm just ready for Air of Fire. I hear it picks up in Air of Fire. I feel like I deserve it at this point. I deserve some intrigue, some actual page turning. Wish me luck. This vlog is just gonna be me getting uglier and uglier. I'm going through it again in terms of like busyness. Like my mental health is fine. I'm just like so exhausted all the time. But I finished Crown of Midnight and it was so mid again, just like the first one. It was definitely different. It got a lot darker than Throne of Glass. There was like these kind of cursed objects that reminded me a lot of the Horcruxes from Harry Potter. So it was kind of giving Deathly Hallows. But at the same time, there was a book that was used to summon demons essentially and open portals into these other worlds that had like creepy shit going on and deceased people if you wanted to talk to them it was like a tempting thing to open this portal but of course it's like pandora's box that reminded me of the evil dead series it got like fucking gory at certain points but obviously you're reading it so it's like your imagination can only traumatize you so much <laughs> yeah things were summoned blood was sacrificed it was kind of crazy and it ended with selena kind of making this journey that kale kind of influenced the king 
into sending her on and Kaol makes a discovery. Dorian and Kaol still feel kind of like cardboard cutouts of men. Cardboard cutout excuses for men. I just don't care about them too much. I'm hoping that changes. We're now into the book that everyone says is when it starts to finally pick up. So here's the hoping. Some actual character progression or something. Also the witch that Selena encounters in this one is called Baba Yellow Legs. I could not take it seriously for a minute. Yellow legs? And yes, she had yellow legs. <laughs> Jaundice looking ass? I don't even know. That was strange. Okay, time to start Air of Fire, I think it's called, and start freaking praying because like I want to DNF. I never DNF. Ugh. If I go through it quickly, it shouldn't be too bad. And if it starts picking up, I'll be fine. But if this one doesn't pick up, I'm just gonna try to like read the rest of them as fast as possible. Wish me luck. I look a mess still. This should be one of the last times I look a mess in this vlog because the busy shit is starting to tone down a little bit. But I am 150 pages into Air of Fire. I haven't done an update in a while because it's still kind of boring me. I feel kind of bad, but I just want to DNF it. But obviously I started this vlog and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to see it all the way through, but I'm just having a little bit of a miserable time. I have a road trip later today to go see Fallout Boy. So hopefully I'll like plow through a majority of it during that and get to what's hopefully some better stuff in the following books. I've heard this one doesn't really get good until like halfway through maybe, or maybe that's what they said about the second one, which it definitely did not. Anyways, notable things that are happening without spoiling anything. Selena's cousin is like fucking coming on to her. And I like kind of gaslit myself into thinking that's not what was happening, but that's definitely what's happening. Um, odd. There's an interesting dynamic going on between Dorian, the prince, and the castle's healer. I'm really glad to see a shift from the love triangle that was happening. Like I love a good love triangle in the right circumstances. Like I liked what was going on with the Hunger Games. I didn't like the Twilight Love Triangle too much because I was always so Team Edward and it was so obvious to me that she was going to choose him because she was obsessed with him that I didn't like that one too much. And I really, really liked the Summer I Turned Pretty Love Triangle, even though it was a little bit juvenile. I still just ate that shit up like I was starving. But yeah, I'm glad this one is kind of like fading out because both of these men are like made of cardboard and Selena definitely, oh my god, if she chooses her fucking cousin, I'm gonna lose my mind. She better just choose that stupid Kale Captain. Captain Kale. That's what I'm gonna call him from now on Captain Kale. It seems a little bit more chemistry going on between Dorian and the healer so we'll see how that plays out but she knows like one of his secrets now so it's like got a little bit more tension to it than whatever was happening with Selena and Dorian which was just like uh, boring you know. I'll probably update you next when I'm in my hotel room or whatever. <laughs> I just want this to pick up. Oh my god I was gonna title this vlog I marathoned the Throne of Glass series but I'm so unmotivated to keep going it's gonna be more like I trudged through the Throne of Glass series finally or something. Don't come for me I'm trying. I would love to hear opinions down below though and why you think it's actually really good or whatever. Convince me because I'm just like not fucking convinced right now. <laughs> far on Air of Fire. So I have almost 200 pages left, a little under 200. I have not given an update in a while because honestly, I barely read while I was in Kansas City seeing Fallout Boy. I read in the car on the way back, but on the way there, it was really dark and late. So didn't really have much light to read. I was also dead exhausted. Didn't read at all in the hotel room. <laughs> And I brought two books. I literally brought this one and I also brought the second one in the series And because I thought I would finish this one and then start a new one. That was ambitious. But I have some more thoughts. I think it's getting a little bit more interesting finally. Halfway through Air of Fire. Of course, I'm not going to DNF it because first, I don't DNF books. Second, I'm doing this for a vlog. Like, I literally committed to it. I'm not just going to DNF it. But it is finally picking up. Like about halfway to a third of the way through the third book in the series. I loved the prequel, obviously, as you saw. I was crying. I was living for it. So many emotions, especially the 
latter part of the prequel. Those last two novellas I rated four out of five stars which is really good. It depends how this one ends, if it's gonna be a three star or a four star. Probably three still just because it's like, you know, for me to only have been having a good time for the last like this much is kind of a bummer. Like that's less than half but we'll see if the ending is super engaging or emotional. Here's the thing, it's like switching point of views a lot, but the reason I'm liking this a little more is because like Kale and Dorian have kind of taken a back seat. I just don't find them interesting to read about. Dorian's got this thing going on with his healer and it's better. It's better. I'm seeing like some actual chemistry going on. It makes a little more sense than Selena and Dorian did. Kale doesn't have like shit going on. He's got some drama with his father. It doesn't show him too much. It's mostly kind of like his friendship with Dorian that gets focused on when it switches to his point of view or whenever it's Dorian's point of view and he happens to be interacting with Kale. And Selena is on this journey. She's been gone the entirety of this book, like from the castle in Otterland. So Dorian and Kale are in the same place. Selena's off in Queen Maeve's kingdom. So she's Faye, I believe. We haven't had a whole lot of interactions with her, but she was basically sent there to like kill that entire kingdom and give their naval plans to the King of Otterland, so Dorian's father. But there are some things happening that I don't want to spoil, but that lead to her not wanting to do that to Queen Maeve. Even though Queen Maeve is like a little bit morally gray, I don't know if I completely like her yet or not, or if we're supposed to, but basically Selena is in that other kingdom and she finds this guy to train with, and his name is Rowan. And things are a little bit if you saw me while I was reading, there were some moments where I was like, come on, now kiss already, you know? And things really started picking up as I was reading this on the way back, Kansas City, from seeing Fallout Boy. That's when things were like really starting to have that same enemies to friends slash lovers dynamic that was really reminding me of the Sam Selena dynamic from the prequel. I just like Selena more with someone who's just a little spicy, not like spicy, but like someone who's just got more pun to them as a character, as a personality, and this guy is like mm, kind of intolerable. I hated him for a second, but like their banter, their interactions, and then when they have like a soft moment together, it's just giving. I don't know. I just like that a whole lot more than anything that was happening with Kale and Selena or Dorian and Selena, especially Dorian and Selena, because Kale and Selena were kind of like not getting along because he's like the guard and she was like the prisoner, you know what I mean? But it still just had no dynamic to it. Like it was just boring. I don't know. Kale is so boring. He's so flat. And here we have Rowan and he's got some personality to him and I'm liking that. And the third point of view that it's kind of flashing back to is this clan of witches. And I'm not sure exactly where they are on the map, but they're basically, I think they've been banished from the wastes. So they're trying to get like their area back. So here we have the wastes are over here and I guess the king of Otterland, wherever it is over here, um, he took that territory from them so they're trying to like get it back and it's this girl named Mainen Blackbeak so she's one of the witches and they're in these like covens so it's like the yellow legs and the blue bloods is it and the black beaks I think it was it's so hard to keep up but if you remember Baba Yellow Legs from what was it one book ago I was laughing about the name she has a whole coven there and then there's the black beaks and the blue bloods and so they're doing some kind of like competition where they have to like train these wyverns I thought it was pronounced Wyvern. I've been informed it's actually Wyvern. And what they are is basically dragons without front legs. So they're like birds essentially. They've got wings and back legs but no front legs. And it looks kind of funny, I'm not gonna lie. But they're supposed to be like super threatening. And Manon ends up picking this runt of the group of Wyverns and her grandmother is really upset with her because like it means she's not gonna like win and she's supposed to be the leader or something. There's a whole hierarchy to that that I haven't been paying a whole lot of attention to. I want to like Manon as a character and I think she is kind of interesting but it's just I'm more invested in Rowan and Selena and when point of views switch back and forth like this I always end up caring about one of them more it's just how it works for me sometimes it gets a little confusing because I'm like okay are we almost done with Manon here but I think Manon's storyline will develop I have a good feeling about how it's gonna go because it does seem like it is kind of picking up in a more interesting direction I just haven't been paying super close attention to the details yeah so there's some like family dramas there there's family dramas with Kale and his father because his father wants him to come back to like his father's 
kingdom and like take over there and Kale wants to be loyal to the king of Otterland and like stay in the castle and like protect his best friend Dorian and the reason he was able to get Selena sent away was like having his father back him up Kale's father back Kale up and the reason behind why they need to send Selena to that other kingdom to like steal the naval plans and like murder everybody who is in that kingdom kingdom like the castle like she was sent there to sabotage and kill everyone who is royal basically but he has like ulterior motives for doing that he's not like he's kind of morally gray too he's not like a huge asshole but he has reasons for doing this i just don't want to spoil them and yeah i might keep reading this morning maybe not <laughs> i'm tired man and <laughs> i have like other things to do i hate being this busy not as busy as i was last week things are still not ideal so yeah that's where i am i just want to keep reading because i just want to see what happens with selena and rowan that's like all i give a shit about right now it's weird because i don't usually read romance a whole lot a lot of it is like super cheesy to me but like when it's romance featured in a genre that doesn't typically have a lot of romance in it i'm like grabbing at those crumbs they're giving me full-on grasping at straws trying to make it more romantic than it is i'm interested way more in the relationships and how characters interact with each other than all this like battle training and training of the wyverns and things like that so i hope selena and rowan are like endgame and kale is like not not in the picture anymore. He needs to find someone else. I'm tired of this Kale Selena dynamic. Okay, so I just got out of the shower, but I finished Air of Fire prior to that, and I've been like marinating on it. The ending was a lot stronger than the beginning and middle. Those sections, the beginning and middle, were definitely slow, but at about like 80 to 90% of the way through, I started understanding why she had taken so long to kind of dialogue through some things. By the end, Dorian also got a lot just better as a character, like I can tolerate him a lot more. Kale is still like, eh, he's just so like cardboard. I'm really into Rowan because his dynamic with Selena reminds me a little bit of how her dynamic with Sam was. Like up until Sam got very declarative of like his true feelings for her and everything. I don't have a whole lot of thoughts other than the ending just in general feels like it was setting up the fourth book, Queen of Shadows I think it's called, in a really good way. Like now I'm starting to feel some potential. Potentially we could have like a four star read now for the fourth book maybe finally. I think Dorian's father, the King of Otterlin, is absolutely insane. I mean, I've thought that for a while, but if Dorian doesn't kill his father, I'm going to be so disappointed because the way things happened at the end of this last book, I was so pissy. I wasn't super upset, but I was just like, this is setting it up too perfectly for him to like take vengeance. At certain points, I was getting like goosebumps because parts of it were reminding me of kind of how I felt while I was reading The Hunger Games, like this rebellion revolution type of vibe. I also was listening to A Throne of Glass playlist to really get into the environment and I think that was helping as well because some of these just drag for so long and take so long to read because they're like 500 to 600 pages but like I need to be listening to some kind of playlist while it's happening my cat is very talkative <laughs> to just immerse myself into the world get me into the right headspace I hear that one of the books that I'm going to be tandem reading Tower of Dawn I think it is is like mostly about Kale so I guess he's still up for debate as a character but as of right now he's still boring a lot of the book was still pretty boring and like and slow and so much character development going on and there were so many switching points of views and I would like be really interested for a second and then it would just be like a few more chapters of like the other point of views until we got back to that set of characters Selena and Rowan. I'm just gonna tell you right now that was like most of my intrigue. They haven't even kissed yet at the end of this book. I don't know if they're actually setting it up for something romantic. Am I just like gaslighting myself? But I feel something coming. It was giving me goosebumps. I'm super invested. It was still a three out of five though just because the bulk of the book I was like like, this is kind of a struggle to get through. I didn't care that much until the end, but I have high hopes for Queen of Shadows. It's the longest book thus far, so it better not let me down because I don't know if I can get through another 500 plus pages of what I just read for the most part. So here's to hoping. I will update you probably when I'm like 50 to 100 pages in, in Queen of Shadows. We're about halfway done and this is a slow, slow burn. It has been quite an acquired taste. I'm very, very glad I started with the novellas because they gave me this hope that it will eventually get better since those were written later on in Sarah J Maas's career. I was like, I know her style gets better. So I'm just gonna push through. Hoping I got to that point now. So wish me luck, please. I am so shiny. I did my skincare. Princess, are you wishing me luck? Are you wishing me luck? You want me to read it to you? There's no cats in the story, I don't think. There's a Labrador, Fleetfoot. He's still around. I love that little boy. Kale like saved him. I think it was Kale. Drama's happening in the castle, basically. 
Okay, so I reached the halfway point of Queen of Shadows. It's been a minute since I've updated because there were like three days where I couldn't read more than like a chapter or two, I think, because I got really busy. Rowan finally made an appearance in this book after Selena left the place that she met him and went back to Otterland. He appeared only like here, like literally just like 10 chapters ago, but this was still very interesting and a lot of action and a lot of really interesting plot points going on. I did miss him though, I'm not gonna lie. And I've been going through some shit, grieving this one character, if you know, you know, stuff that happened in the prequel basically it's all like hitting me hard again i was crying the other day and adding all of these songs to my throne of glass playlist that describe that grief i don't know i just got really sad all of a sudden and yeah i'm glad rowan's back and there's been a few scenes that are like Ooh, what's going on got me kicking my feet giggling in my bed i really like selena with rowan because not only do they have way more in common which i think i've already talked about before but they just seem way more balanced like rowan understands her like he's gone through some of the things that she has gone through if you you know you know and he understands like kale i think sometimes just doesn't get why she is upset over certain things that happened in her past <clears throat> the prequel so yeah they have a balance of like they both lost something very similar in their lives before so i think they're just on kind of more even footing they understand why the other may not be necessarily fully all in they still haven't even kissed yet but i'm like fully manifesting this relationship between the two of them it's also tricky because rowan is literally immortal like he's been around for centuries and selena is 19 true 19 also my last quick little update is there was a scene if you will have read the prequel you know when selena smells her favorite lavender soap on rowan and i nearly lost my shit because of back in the prequel when she was with sam and she smelled the like cheap soap on him because she wouldn't let him use her expensive favorite lavender soap that just the lavender soap has me in a fucking chokehold but oh my god that kind of sent me into a spiral yeah i talked a lot in that first prequel where i was like mm, maybe she doesn't necessarily really deserve Sam. She's kind of a morally gray character. The more we get into the series, the more we see bad sides of her. I'm still rooting for her. I still really enjoy her as a character and think she's ultimately good. We see a lot of her thought processes, but yeah, Rowan doesn't treat her as perfect like Sam kind of did. She kind of didn't deserve him. <laughs> but Rowan is like also, you know, he was irritating me at certain points in the last book and I thought he wasn't treating Selena completely right initially, but you know, they got to know each other. Things developed. Kale also has, I think, a bit of a love interest going on now. Her name is Nesrin. I think she is fully mortal, so I think they're a little bit more matched than Selena and Kale were. Not a lot is happening. We haven't seen a whole lot from their perspective, their point of view, things going on there, but that makes more sense. We also have Manon, the Blackbeak Witch. That's like the third point of view that it's switching to in between chapters, and her dragon, Abraxos. I think that's the name. They're using this like mortal girl, Alide, Alide? I don't know how to pronounce it, to do their dirty work, but maybe she's part witchling? I don't know, it's kind of vague. There's a lot of details going on and it's a very thick book so it's hard to be like 100% on all the time because there's so much going on, so many explanations. I think I'm missing a few things. And lastly, Dorian. Dorian, Dorian, Dorian. <laughs> he was getting better and I think it was the last book and then a whole bunch of shit happened and it's not that he's like bad or I don't enjoy reading about him. It's just like, man, they really just took all possibility from him, didn't they? I'm hoping his storyline ends up playing out in his favor because it's just been upsetting to see. Ugh. Fuck his father. I hate his father. I want him to ultimately kill him. I do. The last book had a perfect setup, as I said, and it's only going farther and farther because the things his father is doing to him, it's like he better kill that man and become the new king of Otterland and he can have this friendly relationship with Selena when she takes back Terrison. I have the tandem read after this. I don't know if I have enough brain cells for that. We're gonna see. I will update you later when I'm farther along. Selena is playing with a demon's corpse for like fun to like tease Rowan. She like grabbed its fingers and was like <laughs> The humor? I love the humor though. Also she was like fighting with some demon and she was like tell me your name and he was like you mortals cannot pronounce our names and she's like oh you mortals can't pronounce our names I've heard this before and he goes okay fine it's Steven. It's Steven. This is not what I was expecting. I have been waiting since the prequel for this one man to be dead and he is finally dead. And the person who killed him is not who I expected, but it's who I needed, especially after seeing this person's backstory and also the irony of it all. Like it's just no spoilers. I'll talk about this more in the spoiler section. <laughs> Jesus 
Christ, they are stringing me along big time with this Selena and Rowan thing. I don't think they've kissed yet still. And I'm just like following this breadcrumb trail, just like eating it up. Jesus Christ. Yeah, the chemistry is insane. Now it makes sense why Dorian and Kale were so one dimensional. Like they just were not what the author had in store for this female main character. So I finished Queen of Shadows. Still not as good as the last two novellas in the prequel, but I think it was better than the first three novellas in the prequel, if that makes sense. Like I wasn't feeling super emotional or moved like I was towards the end of the prequel. Nothing has yet come to the same level as that. But the plot lines are getting a lot more interesting. This wasn't as fast paced as the last one. It is much longer. It does tend to drag a little bit in some places just because I think when you have a book that's over 600 pages. What? What do you need from me? When when you have a book that's over 600 pages you just might run into those issues. I actually enjoyed the witch POVs when it was switching to Manon from the main storyline of Selena and that guy Rowan. I actually had a good time in Manon's POV for this book, unlike with Air of Fire. Basically the witch POV, it, it dives a lot into bodily autonomy and that's about all I'll say there without giving anything away, but the struggle that's happening for Manon is very interesting and she basically gets in this fight with her like second in command because she's the leader of the 13 witches in her like group but she has this cousin named Asterin and her and Manon are really just butting heads for most of the Manon POV throughout the last book and most of this book. Finally within the last hundred pages Manon finally hears Asterin out and understands the brutality of her grandmother because Asterin knows firsthand how their grandmother is not what Manon thinks she is and they kind of decide to team up Manon finally grows a fucking backbone. Now I understand why people like Manon. I think her development was really thought out. So Manon and Astron finally stopped fighting, which is very satisfying. Selena and Manon have an interaction by the end of the book, and they both remind me of each other so much. I hope they interact more in the last three books. I'm now over halfway done with this series, which is weird to think about. Now I'll be starting the tandem read. Other things I liked about this one, Lysandra. Okay, so I don't know if I've mentioned her to you before, but she kind of was a character in the prequel and her and Selena were like enemies. They did not get along. A whole bunch of character development happens basically between the two of them and they find common ground and it's an enemies to friends sort of thing and it's an amazing female friendship dynamic. This series tends to completely sabotage really really amazing female friendships. Horrible things happen with the other two female friendships that I really enjoyed thus far. Will not spoil exactly what happens that ends those friendships but I feel like this one's gonna be endgame. I have a feeling Selena and Lysandra are actually going to be friends until the very end of this series. I better not end up crying or something. No, the only time I've cried so far has actually been just for the prequel. Yeah, it was a very beautiful and meaningful female friendship. I'm getting a little bit bored with Rowan. I was really liking the enemies to lovers dynamic that finally came back after giving us a little bit taste of what that would be like in the prequel, but it just was dragging and dragging. And then when they finally kissed, I think they kissed, I'm not even 100% sure. It didn't have that tension and that angst that it did in the prequel with that enemies to lovers dynamic. Dynamic, so I'm just like not as into it. I'm getting bored with it. No anticipation. I still like Dorian just as middle groundy as I did when the last book ended. Kale, I still don't really have many thoughts about. Maybe Tower of Dawn will change that, but I'm not too sure about that because I've seen a lot of not good reviews of Tower of Dawn. Something happens to him in this book that's kind of unfortunate, but I think things will end up being fine. He seems like too important of character. Maybe he'll become more important later because he's just like stayed the same for so long and Dorian has changed a lot. Overall, I think it was 3.5 out of 5. Rounding down to 3 because it's still just like, I don't know, I'm just not feeling much. Is this blasphemy? I feel like so many people love this series with their whole hearts, but it's just good. It's fine. This one was stronger than all the others. The plot really thickens. I'm glad that I finally was not trudging through Manon's chapters anymore. I think the characters just got a lot more interesting, even though this was slower paced and tended to drag in some points. A lot of development going on. Those are all my thoughts on that. Now you can see my tandem read pictured in the back, but if this goes well, I might decide to tandem read Twilight and Midnight Sun because I still haven't read Midnight Sun. That'll be in an upcoming vlog if this goes well. Hopefully I don't get too confused. I will update as I progress.
come to my attention that I never actually explained why I am doing this tandem read sort of thing. So basically the second to last book in the series and the book before that one both happen at the exact same time within the storyline. So there are certain chapters you can read and then switch between these two books so that you have a better understanding of the actual timeline in your head like when things are happening. So far it seems like this book Tower of Dawn is mostly just focused on Kale in the southern continent so it has a completely different map in the front and then Empire of Storms has all of the other main characters basically. Selena, Prince Dorian, some other ones we were introduced to previously that I don't think I've talked about much. And this is really not much of a POV switching. Well this one is really POV switching like we have the witch Manon. It has now come to my attention her name is actually Manon which I hate. But yeah this one has a lot of POV switching. This very minimal POV switching because it's literally just Kale and Nestrin who is his like new love interest. They go to the southern continent because Kale has found himself in a predicament. No spoilers but the only people who can really help him are in that southern continent. So we have that going down over here. The main storyline takes place like above this on this map and the southern continent is like down here if that makes sense. But Empire of Storms does come first in the series and Tower of Dawn is after that. But the thing is I guess this one ends on a crazy cliffhanger which makes you want to read the final book in the series immediately. But then chronologically I guess you have to skip to this one which is like going back in time and just seeing what happened to Kale while all of this was happening. And if you're not a huge fan of Kale it's just recommended to read them at the same time so that you're not overly bored by this one. Which brings me to my next talking point which is that the Tower of Dawn is actually not that bad. <laughs> I was complaining about Kale a lot from I think the very first book, not the prequels but the very first one in the actual series. He just really got on my nerves sometimes and I think the reason I don't find him that bad in this book is because he finally has a love interest that makes sense. This author seems to do that a lot with characters like because the series is so long she pairs up certain characters in the beginning of the series that are not actually meant for each other and you can tell as a reader so you're very uninterested until they find the person that's like oh I think this is the one that's gonna be endgame. I think we finally found that for Kale which thank god because he was just like having a terrible time with Selena who was not right for him at all. <laughs> the love triangle from the first book that I bitched about for what like probably 10 minutes of this vlog. I have now reached about the halfway point in both of these. I'm a little bit farther ahead in Tower of Dawn because I guess that when you just get farther ahead sooner but there's a huge chunk in Empire of Storms where I will be reading just Empire of Storms for a while and not switching back to Tower of Dawn. Typically it's like one to three chapters with each book before you switch and my last update I have for you guys is that I fucking dreamed I was in this series. I had my first Throne of Glass dream. I don't remember much from it. I feel like I had a love interest but it wasn't one of the characters that we've met yet. At least I don't think it was. It's very fuzzy but for the most part it was like me I think I was by the sea because these continents have a lot of seashore around them. I might have been a mermaid. That would be pretty typical of me. I mean, are we surprised? There have been no mermaids yet appearing in this series, but there have been sea wyverns, which are like sea dragons basically. They haven't really made an appearance, but they've been mentioned. And I am really banking on the fact that once they're mentioned, it means they are going to make an appearance. We've also recently got to a point in Tower of Dawn where I have read the first parts of the book. So I'm on part two and this is what it's called. So they better not let me down. 
either they're going to be actual sea wyverns or maybe possibly mermaids. I don't think so. I don't think there's mermaids in this series, but a girl can hope. And yeah, that dream was basically just very immersive. It was a lot to do with like the geographical area of the series. It's pretty atmospheric. It is high fantasy, so you're in a completely different world that doesn't even exist. So I think it can kind of embed itself into your brain in that way. I think those are all of my updates for today. I'm enjoying it, but still not as much as Assassin's Blade. This series has a tendency to really have have things going, really having the ball rolling. For example, there was one scene with Manon and her grandmother in Empire of Storms that was just crazy and I had to throw my hand over the bottom of the page to not like spoil it for myself. It was so intense and then it just has a tendency to kind of like trudge along after that because there is so much POV switching that it just tends to lose momentum. Like you're building up this insane storyline and then we just switch to another pair of characters or singular character. I think it's just really hard to build momentum that way. I don't know, I'm not a huge fan of this intense POV switching and I think that's honestly why I kind of am interested in Tower of Dawn because it's so consistently about Kale that even though I don't like the character that much compared to a lot of the characters in Empire of Storms like at least I'm not being baited. Yeah it takes a little bit of motivation to get through purely because of all the different points of views. Hopefully I can breeze through these before the end of the week. I don't know it's Wednesday. <music> This is Tower of Dawn, so this is about what we have left. I hope to finish it tomorrow. So Kale, just as a character, is just like kind of irritating, but I'm liking Tower of Dawn because there's a lot going on. It's a new continent we haven't explored. I like the new love interest. There are a lot of redeemable aspects. And the writing of his romance with this new person who like makes sense with him is really good. And I'm enjoying the pairing and the way they have their first kiss is just like so well written it's like it's crazy it has to do with like overcoming this obstacle without giving any spoilers it has to do with the horrible horrible thing that happened to kale in the last book i think it was queen of shadows the fourth one so something happens to him where he has to go to this southern continent to solve that problem and there's this girl who's like helping him and it's just a very climactic scene like it has to do with more than just them kissing it's like he is making a lot of headway and overcoming this problem and like she's helping him and it's just like chef's kiss but like now it's kind of like expanding more on this romantic relationship that they're starting and I just feel such an ick with Kale. Like even though he's not with Selena, who he originally was kind of interested in like in the first book and I didn't like that pairing at all even though she's not involved at all I just get the ick so bad like she's kissing him and he's like putting his hands in her hair and it says she'd kissed and kissed him breathless and panting and then licked actually licked the sweat from his neck and I have the biggest ick right now I don't want to keep reading this. Luckily it's only a few more chapters until I switched to Empire of Storms. I got through that huge chunk in Empire of Storms that was without any switches to Tower of Dawn and that was really interesting. I like Empire of Storms a lot. All of the scenes that had me like having to slam my hand over the bottom of the page so I don't spoil the end of the chapter for myself, all of those moments happened in Empire of Storms. I'm enjoying Tower of Dawn but I feel like I would be enjoying it less if I wasn't tandem reading it just because Kale gives me the ick and this one is a lot more slow paced than Tower of Dawn. But yeah, I just had to get that off my chest. I'm not having a good time with these romance scenes now that the actual tension is over there's no more romantic tension they finally kissed i'm not interested in him he gives me the ick i don't know what it is it's so weird because i don't see like a physical appearance since it's a book character like he sounds like he looks fine or maybe even attractive but it's just his entire ew she's kissing kale that's that's icky <laughs> even though she's a good match for him that's icky spoiler section when they almost killed lissandra i about lost my shit because all of the female friendships that selena has had that ended terribly whether that's betrayal or death i was about to be so pissed off but also the way they were setting that up with those sea dragons hunting her how the hell did she survive the way they were playing into this like oh they'll hunt her to the ends of the earth for killing their offspring like no one could even be safe even in the very middle of 
the continent or whatever and then she survives like it just felt like a cop out but i'm so glad she survived so it's not like i'm that irritated it's just like what was even the point of that scene and i was so excited to see the sea wyverns sea dragons whatever things live in the sea that were like magical but oh my god that one stressed me the hell out okay i am one tab left on empire of storms and two tabs left on tower of dawn and i hear that empire of storms has a crazy cliffhanger ending and the way things seem to be setting up right now i feel like someone's going to die and i feel like it's going to be lissandra because it seemed to have been kind of foreshadowed when the issue with the sea wyverns were happening with her like it seemed like a little bit of a cop-out that she actually survived that like that entire scene was strange to me i'm getting really nervous <laughs> and when i looked up the tandem read and like why people do this and everything it's like done in a specific way to where you end empire of storms first because of the crazy cliffhanger intense ending and then the very end of tower of dawn does spoil empire of storms in that way because tower of dawn does does come chronologically after Empire of Storms. So I think what happens is like Kaol in the Southern Continent finds out the news of what happens at the end of Empire of Storms. And that's when the two stories kind of intersect. I'm getting so fucking nervous. I don't want to lose any of these characters. I keep thinking like there's no way they could kill Dorian because he has such intense powers that match Selena's. Obviously Kaol is not going to die because he has his own whole storyline here. He's not even in the thick of the action. He's in his own book. I don't see them killing Rowan, Selena love interest because that's just too devastating she's been through too much already or maybe there was a returning character recently in empire of storms like the last maybe five chapters someone who did betray selena and ended up coming back and kind of getting on good terms with her again we haven't seen this person since the prequel so it's like crazy and it's such a nod to that and it feels like nostalgic even though like i read all of these pretty close within each other it feels like so much time has passed which there has i guess in the storyline but so Okay, we're gonna finish this tandem read. They better not kill my girl, Lissandra. I'm telling you. Ugh. I'm stressed out. I want a really epic, satisfying ending. I don't want people to die, but I know that's probably gonna have to happen. Also, I oiled my scalp. That's why it looks like shit. It's not like dirty. I mean, I do need to wash it after this, but I wanted the oil to like sit. That's why I look crazy. Let me finish my emotional journey in peace. Okay, so I finished Empire of Storms and I just have the end of Tower of Dawn to finish. I'm assuming they all find out what happens at the end of this book. So that was not really what i was expecting i mean now that i think about it like a cliffhanger i think what i was thinking it would be doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense now that i am thinking about it and yeah i would have been so pissed if i'd have read this book and have had to move on to tower of dawn and not know what happens after this basically like a cliffhanger i mean i knew it was a cliffhanger a cliffhanger doesn't make a whole lot of sense if there's like some intense crazy death but it's unclear it's like someone is missing and the end of this book is like that needs to be resolved we need to figure out where this person is and what's happening to them no spoilers obviously but my prediction was interesting oh god especially considering how it actually went down yeah 100 i feel very firm in my belief of doing the tandem read it's not confusing at all it genuinely just feels like a side-by-side -side timeline of like okay this is what's happening on this continent and then we switch to like what's happening on the other one back and forth back and forth and it just makes a lot of sense some tense shit was happening at the end of this one this is how much i have left you see this little tab oh there's a little bit left a little chunk but things were getting tense because I think they had found out what was going on over here and it was like really bad but yeah I'm I barely even want to read the end of this because it's like what could you possibly tell me that is more interesting than what could be happening in the very final book of the series which I just want to get to right now because like what the hell it was very hopeless feeling like I wasn't expecting to feel so ah uh, really after all of that this is what we're getting but it's dark but like I don't feel super like oh my god what's gonna happen because like it's gonna end well right like I can't be that fucking dead devastated i just feel like these kinds of ya fantasy romantic vibes like it's gonna have a happy ending they're gonna figure out what's going on where this person went and a happily ever after after that huge like 900 page finale book but yeah i don't feel too emotional it kind of reminded me of harry potter in a lot of ways like the chosen one sort of vibe and kind of the hopelessness that happens at the end of the series this is like the penultimate storyline obviously we have one huge book left to go but it feels kind of like the very last book in harry potter before we know exactly who's going to win and all that and you don't know how things are going to turn out for harry that felt more tense than this though i don't know usually this author is really really good with the endings and i was feeling towards the end of this book i was like this is going to be another situation where the ending is just a lot better than the beginning and the middle which is how it's been for a lot of these books but it kind of fizzled out a little it was like okay hopeless shit is happening but i don't know it just didn't like strike me as much as i thought it would i think 
I became way too invested in how people were describing it to me, and I hyped it up in my head a little more than it deserved, I guess. Okay, now we'll see what Kale thinks of all this. Fucking Kale. Okay, so I finished Tower of Dawn last night after I left you. I talked about how I felt after Empire of Storms, and I mostly feel the same way as when I left you. But when I finished Tower of Dawn, I was pleasantly surprised, and I have thoughts comparing the two novels, even though they're kind of blurring together in my mind, obviously, because I tandem read them and I've never read them before, so it kind of felt like I was reading the same book. In general, the Throne of Glass series has a lot of POV jumping, so it didn't feel out of character for me to be like switching back and forth between like five different characters because like that's what happened in the book prior to the tandem read, so it felt like it was just the same book but like Kale's shit and then everyone else's. So the thing is, when you start off this tandem read, Empire of Storms is a lot more interesting and you're like, oh, I have to go back to this like boring book where Kale is doing this boring shit and you don't really want to switch. My kitty. Um, so you don't really want to switch, and so Empire of Storms has a very, very strong start in that way. But there are only two really intense, interesting moments, and I talked about these. There's one with Manon, where she like finally grows a backbone, and it's really intense and crazy, and I had to slam my hand over the bottom of the page so I wouldn't spoil the end result of that for myself. And then there's a moment with Lysandra and the sea monsters, sea dragons, sea wyverns, whatever they are. And is this a spoiler? I'm just gonna talk about it vaguely, but like there's like a sad moment on the beach and that felt very intense but then Tower of Dawn seems more consistent. It's slow paced, it doesn't like reel you in with anything super crazy intense and then drag forever through some other type of POV. It feels like what you see is what you get and it's just a little bit more character development than action whereas Empire of Storms is like all action mostly and maybe a little bit of like strategizing and that tends to drag because you're used to this crazy action from that story otherwise. But the ending of Tower of Dawn was better than the ending of Empire of Storms. As I said the Empire of Storms ending was so hopeless and like sad in this Harry Pottery way and I was just expecting something so much more shocking. I think I read too many opinions online and I'm not like counting against Empire of Storms because it was like hopeless versus stunning, but I was very pleasantly surprised by how the end of Tower of Dawn went and how I was actually very interested in that. At first when I ended Empire of Storms and I still had like 10 chapters to read in Tower of Dawn, I was like, ugh, I don't want to do this. But it ended up pleasantly surprising me. The ending is usually what makes or breaks a book for me, so I would give both of these three stars again, but I feel like Tower of Dawn maybe 3.5 because it really just... The ending of both of these books are obviously what I read most recently, so it's that part that I remember and I feel like I preferred Tower of Dawn's. Otherwise, I really recommend doing the tandem read because what happens to the female main character in Empire of Storms by the end of it, I need to start reading, what is it called? Kingdom of Ash. Look how big this is. I need to get on this today. And I don't even think I have words to explain to you how pissed off I would be if I read Empire of Storms and something like terrible happens to the female main character and I'm stressed. I need to know what's going on. Is she going to be okay? And then to go to a fucking book where I just like look at Kale overcome this little problem he has. It's not a little problem, but compared to what's going on with the female main character, it's like, I just don't give a shit. <laughs> to go from that to Kale doing dumb shit in the Southern continent and like kind of finding his true love interest is like, just not something I would care about and I would have rated Tower of Dawn a two star if I wouldn't have done a tandem read because I would have just been pissed. I would have been in a slump. Some people are saying online that you need that time of Tower and Dawn to really really worry about the female main character and what happened to her at the end of Empire of Storms but I'm just not interested in that. I'm not interested in having this crazy anxiety to the point where I can't even pay attention to Tower of Dawn. That doesn't sound fun for me and I'm just so relieved that I only had to get through like 10-ish chapters of it before I could start on this book. I don't know. And it wasn't confusing at all. As I said, this series has a lot of POV switching anyways. And as long as you tab your chapters like I did and just switch back and forth, I had no issue. The only people I think who are having issues are listening to the audiobook and they forget when they need to switch because obviously you can't tab an audiobook. But I had a good experience. I wouldn't have done it any other way. And it didn't feel that daunting. But yeah, I... I read two like 800 page books side by side, which is a little nuts, but just don't think about that. Don't overthink it. Just start basically. 
is my advice and you're not gonna regret it because you need to go into this right after Empire of Storms. I don't know what to tell you. But I'm only frustrated with Kale making such a big deal out of his predicament only because things were so bad in Empire of Storms and I'm glad I found out as his book progressed because I was sympathizing with him a lot. I was like, oh my god, this sucks and this is just such a, such a huge hurdle he has to overcome because I didn't know what was happening to Selena in Empire of Storms. Those are my thoughts. They're both fine. I don't know. I feel like I'm not resonating with this series as much as other people, but I love the writing. It's so lyrical and even when she writes the more like sensual scenes between characters, like it is romanticy after all. It's few and far between, first of all. I feel like people complaining about that are nuts, but I also feel like people complaining how there's not much spice in it are also nuts because it's like, I don't know, it feels really natural and it feels like way more focused on dialogue, like the way they talk to each other is like, ooh, like... I'm literally sitting here like, oh my god, it's just like butterfly, I don't know. The way they flirt with each other is just, that's like the bulk of the sensual scenes, I guess. I've read some horrible, horrible, bad, 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 horrible intimate scenes in my time. Mariana Zapata, I'm looking at you. <laughs> what the fuck was that in From Blue Cove with Love? <laughs> I was laughing so hard. Usually I'll giggle at stuff like that because it's like, oh my god, haha. Ha. But when I'm full on cackling because your stuff is so vulgar and crazy and unexpected, she calls it a slow burn and it just goes from like, we haven't even kissed yet to like full on porno. The very like last 25 pages, I can't do it. But luckily that's not what's happening here at all. And from my understanding, this one doesn't have any spice in it at all. So it was mostly, I think there was one chapter in Tower of Dawn and then there were like three in Empire of Storms. It was a little bit excessive in Empire of Storms because it was like, God, this is like nuts. Can we get back to the storyline, you guys? Stop distracting me. Okay, so we're gonna start Kingdom of Ash. I really hope I can get through this in a week. It's 980 pages. I'm behind on my reading goal for the year and this is like three books in one. It's not three books in one, but I mean lengthwise, it's like the equivalent of reading three novels. So that's where I'm at. Oh, listen to that heft. Listen to that. Love that. Love that for me. I am on chapter nine. This is like a lot of torture. It's like brutal. Like it's seriously like violent, hard to read, dark shit that I wasn't expecting. Like sure, I've gotten emotional at certain points during this series, but this is like just a lot to be reading. It's loaded. Lorcan is seven feet tall. What happened to him? Why is Rowan only six four? Seven feet? Why? I grabbed a freaking decoy book so that I could read Kingdom of Ash. Yes, yes, go to the decoy book. Go to the decoy book. Yes, yes, yes. Go stand on it. Anyways, um, I didn't work for a second there but now it is i love that now i can read kingdom of ash no 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 no, no. the decoy the decoy <laughs> this is shatter me which i will be reading after this reading vlog this is gonna be my next reading vlog hi baby i'm losing my spot oh my god why is this so difficult to read with a cat hi hi i have finished this 980 something pager i feel wrecked not like emotionally i don't feel much but this series has taken like the better part of three-ish months to read. We're at the end. I'm exhausted. I stayed up late reading this and I was like struggling to get through the last hundred-ish pages. I think the beginning was really interesting because it had all those really dark torture scenes. I don't even remember the last time I updated you or where I was at, but it's just been a lot of battle and war scenes and very action-y. There were some moments of, what's the word? You know what they say about writing about like war is don't write about the cannons, write about the burnt socks or something. I can't remember exactly where that quote is from or what it is. I'm too exhausted, but it felt like there was a lot of the cannons and not as much of the socks and just didn't feel anything. It was kind of how I expected this to go. It did remind me of Harry Potter in some ways and the only other time I was kind of reminded of Harry Potter was in the second book I think it was when there was like the demons in the secret passageways, very chamber of secrets and people were turning up dead. I think I've explained the first half of this book is mostly like crazy dark torture scenes. The female main character is away from the rest of the cast for a good while and they have to figure shit out by themselves when they are not the chosen one. That's a trope that's happening in here. It's three stars, a three star ending. It was fine. I think it could have been a lot worse for a book that's almost a thousand pages. It felt a little bit bloated, a little bit dragged out, but like not terrible. And I'm someone who thinks probably 70 to 80% of all books over 600 to 700 pages probably don't need to be. I think this definitely could have been sheared down a little bit, but I don't think it needed to be any less than like 700 pages probably. There are a lot of things happening and they made sense and weren't things I would cut out, but there was a lot of battle scenes that was just tracking on and on. I was just clinging to 
every bit of dialogue I could get because I did really adore the writing style. I didn't find any of this series cringy or juvenile like a lot of people do especially in the beginning because she started writing it when she was 15 but I could tell that she had just this great gift for writing. Everything was very enjoyable to me. It's just I don't know the action scenes which is a huge majority of the series are kind of falling flat for me like it's very plot driven. I think also the switching POV thing confuses me a little bit like you have to have intense hyper focus. I'm also seeing a lot of people who love this series tend to reread it several times to glean more from it. I'm not interested in having to reread a series multiple times to get everything and grasp it fully. I keep comparing it to Harry Potter because that's the only other experience I really have with reading a seven book long series that is so plot driven, action driven. Harry Potter barely has any romance in it at all and I love that and I think part of the reason was because it is in first person, right? I think there's some flashbacks and Harry uncovers things but it's also just so digestible because Harry, he doesn't know what wizards are in the beginning and you're introduced to this world through his gaze. This is just chaotic. I think you do need to read it a few times. I would recommend this. I feel like there are a lot of people who have loved it so much and it could kind of go either way. That's the thing about this very mid three star rating from me is I can understand why someone would absolutely fall in love with this. It just didn't. I feel like I'm emotionally broken. I don't have a heart or something. I'm just not moved by this. You saw the only time I cried was at Assassin's Blade. Those five prequel novellas I read where I was just like not okay. I was searching for something as good as that and I just couldn't find it. The best part was the prequel which who expects that? I don't know. So I could understand why someone would absolutely love this because it had all of the right ingredients. Just some of the execution wasn't completely my thing. The switching POVs coupled with the very long, intense, plot-driven action-y scenes. But I could also understand why someone would DNF this. She's quite girthy. It's intimidating. And if you are into very character-driven, dialogue-focused, relationship-focused stories, it's not going to be for you. I'm glad I read it. I don't regret it. I've been curious about this series since I was probably like 15. And nine years later, I find finally know what it's all about. I'm glad I do. I'm so exhausted. I was so dedicated to finish this today. I have like no thoughts head empty right now. It felt like it was gonna turn dark for a second there. Much like the way it goes in Harry Potter. I mean it was dark. It was a lot darker than Harry Potter. Harry Potter is like middle grade while this is like definitely YA. I think maybe I should have done a little more baby steps into fantasy before getting into Throne of Glass because I was under the impression that this was the thing that you start with to get into fantasy. This or stuff like it, whatever that may be. But I think I need more of a trope where it's like the chosen one but they are not introduced to the world and maybe not jump right into switching POVs right off the bat. I have read a lot of switching POV stories before but never any more than two or three characters and this is like what five or six especially once you do the tandem read it's just all over the place like I could be reading for an entire day like a hundred something pages and I still would not get back to the character that I was reading about the day previously. <laughs> I'm excited to read Akatar once it's a finished series there are I think three books that she's still going to publish. Some people keep acting like it's a finished series but it's definitely not, right? It looks like there's gonna be a few more published. I think I'll be way more interested in that because as I said I love the writing style but I just maybe want a little more romance. I don't know. I like the concept. It was fine. I don't have many thoughts or opinions which is so boring. Good writing, a little slow but not bad. If that's a boring reading vlog, I don't know what to tell you. I would love to hear all your thoughts on this series down in the comments. I kind of wish this could be made into a TV show or a movie or something because I feel like I would digest it a lot faster and easier and also if I consumed all of it in one go in like a week as opposed to three months, I might be remembering pieces from the beginning more that would resonate with me more when they're kind of like brought back in at the end. Connections are made. I want an abridged version. That's what I want. I want an abridged version to go back and read or listen to on an audiobook so I can kind of immerse myself in it a little more. I did really really like the setting and the atmosphere of it all. I had a second Throne of Glass themed dream last night where I I was in Aurelia, I think it's pronounced like that, the continent that this takes place on that is not in our world. Man, I just wanted to be there. It just looks, looks, seems and looks in my head to be such a wilderness, beautiful, untainted by pollution sort of place. Obviously there are no like cars. It's not a modern world that this takes place in. Uh, it just seems so nice to be in such nature 
all the time. Even the cities. Everything just felt so lush and vivid in my head. This author has really really good writing. The fact that I didn't even like it that much and I was dreaming that I was in the story regardless, she immersed me and I give her props for that definitely. Please let me know your thoughts on the series down below. I need to go take a shower and go to bed. I'm like dying right now. Now we're gonna skip into the spoiler section. I'm pretty sure I only have like one clip from the spoiler section and that's me celebrating my victory at one of the characters dying which is kind of funny i don't even remember this at this point like i don't even remember where i was or how i said it yeah click off now if you do not want to watch that spoiler give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it if you want to follow me on my instagram it is right here if you want to follow me on my tiktok it is right here my next reading vlog will be the shatter me series which i'm starting hopefully tomorrow from my understanding this is more dystopian romance fantasy mix i'm hoping i can fly through them quickly look at the size of this font in comparison to Throne of Glass. <laughs> Wish me luck. Such an anticlimactic ending. It's over. I'm done. I hope you have an amazing day. Bye, guys. Arabin is dead and I'm so happy because that sleazy ginger piece of shit has been getting on my nerves since the prequel. And the fact that Lysandra killed him, like someone who, you know, he has seen since she was essentially a child and he like took her innocence from her. She was one of the only people around him who was not trained as an assassin and she was the one to actually do it. Something about that is just chef's kiss. I'm so happy Arabin is dead. I'm just so happy I don't have to see him again in this book. I don't have to see his sleaziness. I don't have to see him like touching Selena's lower back like those nasty men in bars. I am really celebrating right now. I'm halfway through Kingdom of Ash and I'm looking at like fan posts online and I saw this one and it said Selena is dead. Like she wasn't able to fight against the Valg princes and everything. She wasn't strong enough and they killed her leaving only Aelin. But now she's with Sam. <laughs> God, shit. That makes sense though, because like starting off with the prequel, I was like, these two have to be endgame. And I still feel like, I don't know, I was just more into Selena and Sam than Aelin and Rowan. And like, that's why. It's like, it's not really that he was supposed to be with Aelin, like he was supposed to be with Selena. Oh my god, ah! That's painful. Wait.